Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz, with me today, very special guest, two-time former WWE World Tag Team Champion. He, of course, was an American Gladiator Champion. He is known as Rico Constantino. Rico, welcome to the two-man power trip. How are you doing? Thank you so much, John, for having me on your show. What is going on in your world? I know we were just kind of briefly talking about it. Off well, air, you just had surgery. Yeah, I had surgery. I got injured on work at work, broke my hip and tore my hip flexor. And the workman's compensation program out in Nevada is not the best. And they made me work. Well, actually, they didn't help me for 16 months. I stayed with this injury and I didn't miss a day of work. I still worked every day, hobbled around, but I wasn't going to sit at home. And uh, after 16, well, after after about four months, uh, an intermediate came in, somebody who monitors the lawyers and workman's comp. And within four months, she got my surgery, got the doctors lined up. And uh, I went through surgery on the second. And uh, it's been really quick. My healing's really quick. Um, I was walking 10 minutes after I got back in the room. And uh, I have a two story. So uh, within the first week, I was walking up and down the stairs with a cane. I, I walked with the walker, you know, me uh, started getting right into the exercises, had a nurse show up uh, four different times. And then the physical therapy here at home, three days a week. And I'm already walking around the block with uh, the walker. Nice. So Man. recovery is going good. Um, <clears throat> I can't wait, you know, and the doctor has restricted me from driving. So I can't drive, which means I can't go to a rehab center. So I see him this Friday and I hope he clears me to drive and gets me into a rehab center. And this way they'll work on my hip. And then after they're done with my hip, I'll stay and then I'll, work on the rest of my body, you know, to get it back in shape to really hit the gym. So I won't have all that lactic acid and, you know, the pain that comes back when you've been off work, working out. I've been out of the gym for 17 months. Man. Turned 62 in October. So crazy. it's crazy. Like to think that you're, 62 because you got into wrestling in like the late 90s right so i always think no like, no yeah oh. i was uh 1999 i signed my developmental started in 98 signed my developmental 99 debuted well i started professional wrestling actually training at the age of 38 and i was oh, with yeah. jesse hernandez in the empire wrestling federation in san bernardino and uh a tape went up and the next thing I know, Finkel's calling me, asking me to come out for a tryout. So I tried out, I got a developmental 38 and a half. And then after I did the OVW, when all the developmentals came down, my, I debuted at 40 years old on TV. So not normal for WWE. I'll tell you that much. They, they you know, it's usually the younger guys, right? Yeah, usually, but I've kept myself in good shape throughout the years. Never abused my – well, I did abuse my body, but I always took care of it. You know, American Gladiators. I was the stunt Batman at Six Flags. I played the Michael Keaton Batman. I was in the Universal Studios Conan show. I was part of a group called the Power Team, the Christian Power Team, that breaks bricks and rips phone books and stuff like that. I did that two years, 15 years as a cop, 15 as a executive protection overseas. So my body's been through a lot. Like I said, it's not my age, it's the mileage. Right, right. But it's interesting that you got into wrestling so late. Why did you get into it so late? Well, I've always been a fan of wrestling. Back in Vegas when I was a kid, we used to show AWA here. And AWA used to come to Las Vegas to the showboat for Gagne's League. So I, you know, Greg Gagne, Rocky Johnson, Pat Patterson, The Sheik, 
you know, his whole crew. So I always loved pro wrestling. And just things took me in different directions. I never, I didn't know how to get in, you know, and stuff like that. You know, you got to be, I, d- I never knew what the tryouts were. And like I said, after American Gladiators, movies, stuntman, and stuff like that, I was bodyguarding in Florida. And in 1998, my brother asked me to come back to Las Vegas and be his general manager for Bell Bonds Company. Well, when family calls, you answer, no matter what you're doing. So I came to Vegas. I got my Bell Bonds license through the Division of Insurance in Las Vegas, which qualified me as a quote-unquote bounty hunter, general manager, stuff like that. And he was already going to Empire and wrestling for fun. And he asked me to go along. I said, I'm 38. What am I going to do? You know, WWE is never going to pick me up or WCW because that's when they were both strong. And uh, so I went with him one time and played around. And I said, hey, this is kind of fun. So to give you an idea of the time, we'd work all day, drive three and a half hours to San Bernardino, work out three hours and drive back three and a half hours. You know, you, we did that a couple times a week. Jesse saw something and he goes, I need to train you. you you've you got it, whatever it is. And he started training me. And I was, a, I was the first rookie heavyweight title holder for that league. I, 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 was, uh, I was there eight months, had 12 matches. And then Vince called. Wow, crazy! What a what a quick uh, ascension! What did Vince like see, or or who saw you to send? I don't know. I think Doc. I don't know who saw it up in the beginning. I don't know who saw or what they thought. Uh, I was I was part of the last Dory Funk Dojo. With Doctor Tom, yeah, Doctor Tom Dory. And uh, at the end, you know, Cornette was there. And, you know, I didn't lie about my age. I told them how old I was and stuff like that. Well, Cornette didn't get that. And we were at Killer Kowalski's and we just finished our our little match and stuff like that in, in his armory. And Cornette comes screaming and hollering and what's the matter with you and this and that. I'm like, well, what'd I do? He says, I just got told how old you were. I said, yeah, 38. He goes, I thought you were 25. (laughs) (laughs) I said, no, I'm 38 years old. So uh, he walked away and stuff like that. And Dr. Tom came up and he goes, I think they're going to sign you to a developmental. So we were there back at WWE or WWF at the time, Connecticut. And Cornette came up to me and he goes, listen, I want to sign you developmental come to Louisville. I'm taking over OVW for WWE, Danny Davis's crowd, you know? And I said, sure. So in July 99, I drove to Louisville and uh, trained under Danny Davis's guys. What did you think about Cornette? And what did you think about OVW? Loved it. I loved it. Uh, those fans, the local fans, and this is we were in the in the real crappy building in Jeffersonville, on the new Davis Arena. But fans showed up. They brought me in. My first, I land from the plane. I get brought right to Louisville Gardens, and my first match is Vito and Guido Andretti. I didn't even get a chance to see the facility. Nothing. I landed, had a match. Well, they're throwing you to the wolves right away. Well, they wanted to see, I guess, but did the match. And they liked you. Well, I would have been signed for the deal. But I mean, like, they like what they saw. Like, yeah. Or yeah, that. They, they, yeah, they must have. And then uh, Cornette, I was the first uh, developmental to show up at OVW. And I don't remember the order, but Brock came, Orton came. Uh, ben, ben, Benjamin, Batista, uh, 
and then uh, Haas went to Heartland, and uh, I think that's that's it. Oh, Ron H two O Waterman was part of OVW, and I came in as a face. They ran off my American Gladiator fame, you know, for being champion. Yep. So I had the red, white, and blue tights, you know, and the tassels, and and people took to it. And then I was I was a a good baby face. So did you, to, uh, did you happen to see any of those American Gladiator documentaries that they did? Thirty Thirty, I don't recommend, but Muscles and Mayhem, I do recommend. And the funny thing, when I tried out for the show, I think there was twelve to fifteen thousand people that tried out across America. Whoa! Four, four or five locations. I ended up being in Universal Studios, and I went through the Contenders Challenge, which was like. 25 chin-ups in 30 seconds, pass or fail, 40-yard dash in under so much time. Uh, that ladder, ladder, you, know, you touch a line, go back, touch a further line, go back. That ladder race, you know, the ladder yep. drill. One-on-one yep. uh, -on -one tug of war, pass or fail. You got to be on power ball once you were offense, next time you were defense. And then... Um, Ladder race, that, da, 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 da. and then an on camera interview. And they pick, you know, then they they choose from that. Well, as I finished the contender tryout, a little guy walked up to me and ended up being the producer of the show, Aton Keller. And he goes, Rico, I want to, I want you to come over here. Yeah. He goes, I want you to try out to be a gladiator. Cause after the, the pilot season, they were getting rid of uh, Titan and Malibu. So they were going to replace two gladiators. So I tried out and went through that tryout. When, we, when they sent me the letter, they said, we want you to be a contender. I was happy both ways. You know, I got to be right. on the show. And um, after I saw Muscles of Mayhem, I'm glad they didn't pick me for a uh, gladiator. Those poor guys got treated like crap, robbed, robbery without a gun. They signed everything away. And me as a contender, I had to sign everything away also. No royalties. And the funny thing is, the little red Challenger doll, my picture is on the box wow. swinging and hang tough. I also have four trading cards I did a TV guide, you know, Gemini and I did a TV guide, uh, at a story. I mean, it was more about the gladiators, but I was the contender. So yeah, we got nothing from that. And I heard me being champion, uh, fall champion got 10 grand, which was more than they made the whole season. Cause wow. they run the, they run the season in about three to four weeks. You like in the third week of June to the second week in July, they run the fall and spring season simultaneously. And it takes 10 hours to do the whole thing, 10 hours. So you're there 10 hours a day. Crazy. And you're right. The Muscles of Mayhem on Netflix is awesome. The 30 for 30 on ESPN is awful. I mean, it's terrible. Yeah, it's almost unwatchable. Yeah, because it's about the creator, Ferraro. He oh. and I definitely didn't get along. And he, he stole his like buddy's it. idea and won't let his buddy <clears throat> talk. Yep. Crazy. Yep. Yeah, he's he's not one of my favorite human beings. Yeah, he, you could just tell. And he's trying to make himself not seem like smarmy and stuff. You could just tell he's a total scam artist. Yeah. I know. These are my kids. <laughs> nice. I like that. Nice. They're, they're, they're camera hogs. See, yeah, they, they really like, are. Yeah, they love it. They, yeah, like, they like to get in the picture. Yep. I have an 80 gallon downstairs. This is an 80, and I have a 20 right next to me. Specialty fish. Yeah. Yep. This Very sits cool. right across from my bed. So when I lay down in bed, I look at these, and there's a timer. So it goes off at a certain time, comes on at a certain time. So by the time I fall asleep, then the light goes out after I'm asleep. Very peaceful. 
Nice, nice. Now, you were never grand champion, correct? Almost grand no. champion, right? No, so the night of the championship, I got a concussion. Oh, Nitro, wow, okay. threw, Nitro threw the dummy, except he went to throw it and he faked, and I already started to do the block, and then he threw it and hit me right on top of the head, knocked me cuckoo. You know, that's why John finished before I did, because nobody ever beat me in the Eliminator. But I finished because I had so many points on the ass. He, he, he couldn't overcome them. Right. Man, what a what an experience. What a show. What a, a timepiece, if you will. You know what I mean? Like perfect. Oh, yeah. Like late 80s, early 90s. Great people, stuff. People asked if it was real. Yes, it was real. I mean, there were people there, judges, to make sure the contests were accurate. Uh, OSHA was there because, you know, you had to build things and, you know, uh, breakthrough and conquer is easy. Power ball is easy. Joust, you have to make sure the pedals are okay. The wall was already built and just pushed back. The hardest thing to build was the last one, the eliminator. So that took the longest. But a lot of these people, yeah, I had martial arts background. They didn't know how to calm down after one of the events. So they would stay hyped all 10 hours of the day. So after like the third event, four, five, six, seven, you start seeing them because they stayed too hyped all day. Yep. None they of never, energy, yeah. No, they burped it. Yep. Me, martial arts, I went, okay, and the match. And we didn't have a locker room. They put us under the bleachers where the fans sat. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Yeah, we didn't have locker rooms. That didn't come till later. Wow. Now, just going back to OVW, because I'm just so curious. You mentioned all those guys, Cena, Batista, Lesnar, Benjamin, all those guys coming in. Did you ever think that you would make it to WWE TV, given those guys, like their size and their look? Like those are quote-unquote Vince guys, right? They're muscle guys. They're 6'4", yeah. and they're you know, maybe even uh, some steroid guys mixed in there. Not yeah. not going to say who, but there might be yeah. some mixed in there as well. But did you ever think, like, oh, there's no way I'm going to get called up. I'm going to make it WWE because... Look at these guys. I don't look anything like these guys. That's why I worked on entertainment. That's why I worked on my promos. And I, I was going to save it for later, but I have a mantra that I've lived by because I grew up with ADD and OCD. And I think I got a splash of autism because I rock. I Even mm. in a, a regular chair, even before my matches, that was the big joke in the locker room. I would rock with my eyes closed and go over the spot and go over the spot. And as far as answering your question, well, I was there serious. You know, I even worked out the days they didn't, they said, take a break. Nick Dinsmore used to train on Saturday, all the local people who wanted to become professional wrestlers. So I would go there. Danny would be late night at Jeffersonville doing uh, thing, uh, taping and stuff like that and editing and stuff. I get points from Davis, you know, I, I spent my whole time cause it was a job. So my mantra is whatever was, you know, what your mind can conceive, your heart can achieve. So I never know. once did I doubt myself that I could not make the roster, but and, and as a matter of fact, I wasn't going to make the roster. Vince was just going to cut me, give me my 90 days and cut me. But if it wasn't for JR, Danny, Cornette, and Stone Cold, I'd have never went up. Because they told him, well, you're going to cut him. You got to pay him. Just bring him up for dark matches and see if you get an idea. So one day I was a face, the other day I was a heel, and it went back and forth. And what about Waterman, Brock, me, and Orton traveled together. Wow, quite a group there. Damn. I like that group. What What did Austin, though? I'll, I'll get to that group in just a second. But what did Austin, like, how did he know, like, know of you? Well, what happened was we had something in West Virginia. And there was this huge guy imitating, like, a Kevin Nash knockoff, Russ McCullough. And oh, yeah. he, was he was supposed to be a heel. Well, he goes out during the show and turns himself babyface on the mic. And this stone cold Christmas chaos thing's coming up. Cornette 
popped it. I'm talking, I've never seen his face redder than that. It was fire engine red, screaming and hollering. Really was. So Russ was supposed to face Stone Cold and get stunned at Christmas Gardens. Now he replaced Russ with me. So I was the role model. I already turned heel. And so I was a heel. So I was the role model in Louisville, you know, Kentucky, not Louisville. But if you'd say Louisville to those people, they get upset. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Woo-hoo. So, you know, and then I have my prototype, Cena, you know, to show how all you people need to act and get your stuff straight. So Stone Cold's out there talking and I interrupt and stuff like that. And, and Stone Cold just... He just does what he does. So we talked about it just a little bit, how we're going to do the dialogue and didn't have really set lines. Just I'll do this. You do that. Yes, sir. (laughs) You know, what else are you going to say to him? So we go out there and I get the last word in. And then all of a sudden, the middle of the interview, Stone Cold turns around and starts walking away, getting out of the ring. And I, I and that threw me. And I, I Jerry goes, you better call him back. So I grabbed the microphone and I said, Hey boy. <laughs> and he stopped. <laughs> I said, Don't you ever turn your back on me, son. And of course, you had that rattlesnake walk back to that ring, yeah. and it's building up. Everybody knows I'm gonna get stunned. So he comes in, he plays his nice guy. Oh, this is your house. I'm going to let you have your fun. And, you know, he's he's doing enough disrespect, but not where I'm going to fight him, where I'm thinking he's given up. So he's asking the audience. And I said, I can't remember what I said. It's like, yeah, now get out of my ring or something like that. And, of course, he looks over here, looks over there, you know. And all of a sudden, boom, bang, stunner. Nice. So I guess he, I guess he liked the way I did the promo. Uh, wasn't rehearsed. Uh, called him back in the ring. Uh, I guess I don't know. I've never asked Steve what he thought of it, but he must have said something good. Jr. was always my fan. When Jr. used to write up the articles on the developmentals, Jr. was always positive. The only thing that hurt me with Vince was my age. Right. And which is a thing to this day that I hear some of the guys he's worried about, or, you know, before he retired, worried about some of their age and he would get on them about their age. So that that's still going on today. Yeah. Brooklyn Blarler came up to me and he goes, I retired at 40. You debuted. He goes, something's wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. What is uh, up with that that riding team you had, the, the, your riding partners? That seems like uh, quite a fun ride. Which one? They, you're, they, you were with an OVW, uh, the Lesners of the World, and you know maybe some uh, your traveling partners. Oh, yeah. I I got along with everybody. You know, I'm. I you know we're there to do a job. You know, and you got to know your job. You know, and by that time when I was traveling. All of Danny's crew, you know, Rob Conway, uh, Damage, uh, Doug Basham, uh, did I say Nick Dinsmore? Rob Conway, yeah, Nick Dinsmore, yep. Flash, those core group, those that core group of guys, Rip Rogers is also one of them. You know, um, I listened to everything they said, you know, and I was always told, you know, God gave you one mouth and two ears for a reason. And that reason is you listen twice as much as you talk. And I was told by one of the vets, uh, you know, keep your ears open and your mouth shut, rookie, and you'll learn something here. I took that as good advice. Never said anything uh, unless I had a question about how to get into this and get into that. But I never questioned anything. I just listened and Nick Dinsmore, Rob Conway, Flash, I uh, took a liking to me and they spent time with me. 
I remember my first match, I was going to go out after a few weeks of TV and I had to wrestle Nick and he looked at me and goes, well, what do you want to do? And I thought that was kind of odd me, him being the more veteran guy. So I went, okay, uh, let's do this. And I'm going to do this and then this, and then I'll do this. And then you do that and I'll do this and I'll do that. And, I'll do that. and he's just looking at me and I'm just so excited. This, this, that. And he just sat there and just looked at me. And when I was done, he goes, is that it? I said, yeah. He said, Rico, we got six minutes. You don't have to get all your shit in. <laughs> I said, oh, and now that's how he taught me, you know, but very polite, respectful. You know, he gave me a good lesson, but he didn't go, hey, what are you doing? I, 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 nothing. He goes, you got six minutes. You don't have to do everything. Smart. Yeah. Yeah. He, he teach you a lesson there. Yeah, for sure. It did. And it stuck with me. Now, when you actually do get called up, you're mentioning kind of like, you know, Jim Ross is saving you. So Vince is just like, ah, oh, he's too old. Let's just cut him. And JR is like, no, let's keep him, basically. Basically, four of them uh, JR, Cornette, Danny Davis, and Stone Cold. So when they do call you up, how does that go? Does JR just say, hey, let's, let's look at... Nobody look said at nothing. I got oh, a no, phone okay. Call. I got a phone call from Finkel. Okay, we're going to bring you to Ottawa this week. Uh, what am I doing? Just get on the plane. I get on the plane, show up Ottawa, and then I get informed, you're going to be Billy and Chuck's stylist. <laughs> Now, I've only been wrestling, what, a year now, year, year and three months? Yep. I'm wet behind this ear, and I'm green behind this ear for wrestling. Managerial stuff, I got zip. I know nothing about managing. Hmm. So when they told me I was going to be their manager, their stylist, I called Kenny Bolin immediately. Help, Kenny, help. Well, try and do this. This is what you do. This is my timing. Da 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 da. And Billy Gunn saw I was so worried. And I said, "I've never managed. Uh, I, I I don't know what to do." He goes, "I'll let you know what to do. Don't worry about. It. Let's go out." And then I jumped in on the Hardys. I either, I think I hung him over the top rope, or I gave him a spinning heel kick, and we retained retained the titles. But I came out black shirt, black pants, like Stevie Richards did after he left right to censor. And I didn't want to copy that. And another story before I got called up, cause I was doing face, heel, face, heel, face, heel, you know, in the house shows. And even at tapings, we'd go out and wrestle. Raven came up to me. He was, I mean, nice guy. And he's good. He knows the business. No psychology. He goes, what do you like being, a face or a heel? I said, you know, I like I like being a heel. He goes, then we got to do something about that face. I said, what do you want to do? He goes, you're too pretty. Grow some sideburns. So right. he wanted me to grow honky-tonk sideburns, which were, done, were already done. I'm not going to copy Wayne. And uh, he, then he wanted me to do the corporate. I like that rock did that. So I just went full, I went full out Wolverine. The big mutton chops. Yeah. Huge mutton chops. Yeah. And it caught on, but they were, but when I first debuted, they were just growing in, just growing in. So that's how the, that's how the sideburn started credit to Raven and a stylist. After the show ended, I saw Vince and I said, all right, you want me to manage them, but you want me to do it as a stylist? Am I a hairstylist, fashion stylist? What kind of stylist am I? He goes, flesh it out, and then turned around and walked away. I got no help from creative, no ideas wow. from anybody, and I went, okay. So I went home, and I knew I was going out the next week because Billy and Chuck are tag holders. So I'm laying in the tanning bed going, stylist, stylist. And 
it's running through my head, all certain things. And then all of a sudden I went, got it, got it. I am going to be their image consultant, like how they have in New York. Yes. So I went, okay, image consultant. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be their manager, but their image consultant. So I think it was the next week after that, I went and bought a black alligator suit. I think I wore blue shirt. When I wore a blue shirt, I had blue lenses. I had two belly button rings in my ear and the jewel was blue. When I wore red, red glasses, red belly button ears, came out doing the hair. <laughs> you know, I got the champs interfere with matches. And then they, the, the hate came out pretty quick from the fans. Oh, yeah, I would imagine big time. But they don't really give you that direction. That's like you giving yourself the direction that they're supposed to give you. So I wasn't important. And like I said, Vince didn't want me up there in the first place. The two characters Vince gave me, if you read my Wikipedia page, is the exact opposite of who I actually am in life. Yeah, for sure. You know, but this was my assignment. We are professionals, or I am, and a lot of guys are. I had to think of something to make this work. It'd be like on a movie set. They want you to play this. you got to figure out the part, assume it, you know. There, that's called method acting. Then you become yep. that character, you know. Uh, the stylist one, uh, I had to make that up from scratch. Funny, it's like the a cop, right? Who's also American Gladiators champion. So you know you're beating Batman. These huge, yep, <laughs> you're beating these huge muscle bound guys in in one instance. But then here it's like, oh, let's have him play an effeminate stylist character. Like it doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Weird. So was it a rib on you though? Like was he trying to mess with you? You think or no? I think he wanted me to fail. And the reason why I think that, this is why I back that up, is one day, this is when I was uh, still not called up yet, I'd work out in the ring. Every house show, I'd put an hour or two, I'd show up at three hours early to a house show, put an hour or two of working on my technique and stuff like that uh, with Fit Finley, Dean Malenko, you know, or anybody that was in the ring. You know, I, I was a student of wrestling. I, it, it, it consumed me. I loved the business. I wanted to be the, I wanted to be the best I could be, you know, I wanted, I, and I wanted to, you know, do things right. So we're sitting there doing that. And for some reason, Shane's in the ring. I guess he's got something coming up uh, on either raw or SmackDown or something. I don't know. But I'm practicing, and then I get a drink of water and stuff, and Shane walks right up to me, looks right at me and goes, you know, Rico, you're going to be nothing but a flatbacker. Oh. Which, which is a jobber. Right. That's what he said. And I went, oh, okay. Which made me more determined. Right. Damn, why, and, why did he say that, though? That's kind of strange. Uh, <laughs> Vince and I didn't like each other, but Linda McMahon and Stephanie McMahon and I got along great. Interesting. Yeah. And Shane and you didn't get along either, I guess. I didn't like the guy. For him to say that to me, to one of right. his independent contractors, that I'm supposed to be making him money, wouldn't you want me to do good? Be another character? Something different? You know, wouldn't you want me? I had a good-looking body at 40, yep. you know, and you, I showed you me at 61. Yeah. Yep. You know, you know, and I could move, you know, I can actually do stuff. And then the martial arts started kicking in and people were going crazy for it, especially in Tokyo. Oh, ay, ay, ay. Yeah, definitely. They would they love that stuff. Yeah. Now, now you, you like Shane says that, but you know, you're working on getting better. You're doing this. But do they actually ever mention to you, like, this image consultant, this stylist, he's an effeminate character? Is he supposed to be a gay character? Is he not? Like, what's the issue? Like, what's the thing there? Flesh it out. 
That's what Vince told me. So no, even after the fact, he doesn't even explain the character. Nope. Wow, crazy. I just go out and do what I do. I came up with ideas. I go to creative. Uh, the clothes, uh, the, the outfits and stuff like that. Because yep. Godfather was on his way out. And I know I know Bear. I've, I've known him since the 70s because he lives in Vegas. And I said, I said, hey, Bear, where did you get your clothes? I'm going to get some outrageous stuff because I'm taking this character over the top. So he told me where to go. And I bought the tiger stripe, the snake skin, the alligator. You know, I bought all that stuff, which was ridiculous. But that's yep. what I was supposed to do. You know, in my mind, the more ridiculous, the more absurd, and then me trying to put it over, you know, the fans were just, oh, my God. Did you like Billy and Chuck, the gimmick? I came into that gimmick, and that's the reason why I came in. I was told that they were losing heat, so I was supposed to go in there and bring more heat, which okay. worked. Yep, definitely. Uh, I, I uh, Billy, you know, he kept helping me too because I kept picking his brain during the matches, getting my timing down as a manager, what to look for, how to work the crowd, when to work the crowd. Sometimes, I mean, later on, I wasn't even looking at the crowd. I was watching the match and they're yelling, here Billy and or Chuck is beating the crap out of the face and they're yelling, Rico sucks. And I ain't even talked to him. I have my back to him. So, you know, as I say, credit to, credit to Billy for that. You were getting a lot of heat, helping the team get a lot of heat for sure. I was just interested, like, with just your thought on that gimmick just in general, because obviously they're they're playing supposedly a gay gimmick right. together, but they're right. not saying it. They're just being very obvious about it. Yeah, it's a dichotomy. See, that's yeah. what, that's where Adrian Street got it over. And that's why Adrian Adonis failed. Because he came right out of the closet, said it on an interview. I saw it on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Yep. And, and, and it killed the character. You know, so with me acting the way I acted, I never acted in fem in feminine. I acted in feminine, but I didn't act gay, you know, prancing. You know, doing my doing the hair, fussing over Billy's hair, their headbands. They got a match, you know. So that was the closest thing you could say that is he's gay or so. There was no real, no real uh, moving forward in that direction. You know, it was just being innuendos. Yep. You know, imposing together. The funny thing was like the, the what they were giving each other gifts. You're like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> like yeah. it was really weird, but it was good. I mean, they were that's, awesome. That's the innuendos. That's yeah. the innuendos. See, yeah. and Billy, Chuck, and I went to Vince and said, we, you know, we don't mind doing this as long as we don't uh, bash this lifestyle. Right. We don't want to show them in a bad light. We don't want to, you know, uh, go. I don't know, racist is a word for it. We don't want that. We don't want to offend them. In fact, after we got done with the Billy and Chuck thing with the wedding, Glad gave us an award. The teapot, the kettle, and the and the it's just one of their awards. It sits in Connecticut. Wow, nice. Yeah. So for the way we portrayed them and did it respectfully, they gave us an award. When you become like tag champ and they're basically with Rikishi, right? But they're the tag champs. What was that storyline supposed to be? Because there was, oh, it, that was a little convoluted, just as like their manager is going to be wrestling. I mean, it just seemed a little convoluted. Just on Because you know. that's when Vince and Rikishi were having their feud. And uh, he wanted all three of us to beat up on Rikishi, teach him a lesson. Yep. So that's why I was his surprise partner. Well, I ended up super kicking Chuck and then Rikishi got me and I fell over Chuck one, two, three. And now Rikishi and I are champs, but I have to hold the tag team together. 
But what I really loved was the gold. You know, I was like, when they walked away, I would hug the gold and be like, yeah, I'm yeah. champion, I'm champion. You know, and then when Billy kept it, I'd be like, well, I, I'm trying, I'm trying. You know, I'm trying to get the titles back. And it was it for both of making you a baby face at all at, at that point? Oh, no, 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 nah, it was to show my greed, mm. you know, uh, that I took the uh, you know, the gold and then I really didn't care about Billy and Chuck, and I was always making excuses why the match wasn't coming up quick enough. So they yep. milked as much as they could out of that, and then Billy and Chuck got the belts back because I hit Rikishi with the belt. Yep. Which you finally did what was right for the team. Did right for the team, which made everybody hate us more. Right, right. Because Keish was big baby. Big baby face. Oh, yeah. He's one of the best. I feel like, um, I don't know, maybe um, under the radar a little bit, but uh, Rikishi was always one of the best. Oh, yeah. When he when he broke out in his dance, when, when he was with Scotty Too Hotty and stuff like that, people went crazy. Got his fedora. When, yes. When you're there, right, with Billy and Chuck and all that's going out, are you actually on the road with them too? Are they like your travel? Oh, yeah, I did ride with Billy and Chuck because he could throw off a nugget of advice and I wouldn't be there. And I'd be like, I'd, I'd miss something. So I right, was right. Because Chuck was always asking questions from Billy. I didn't have to ask anything. Chuck always asked questions to make himself better. So I'd just be sitting in the back seat. Yeah, taking notes. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I said, I want I wanted to be a sponge. I wanted to learn everything I could learn. You mentioned that the wedding, right? And yeah. Then it's, re then it's revealed they were lying the whole time, that they were faking it. And it, like, how did you think that that came off? Because I thought it came off awesome on TV. The, the Bischoff swerve was great. Uh, so many people still didn't know it was Bischoff, which is crazy. Vince kayfabe the whole everybody kayfabe the boys and everything brought Bischoff in his limousine to the arena. So he's walking around like that old minister. Vince even took him to catering, brought him a plate of food, waited hand and foot on him, introduced him to people. Nobody knew different except the people in that segment. And when he said, wait a minute, did I hear myself say three minutes? I swear everybody in that arena inhaled at the same time, went, oh, my ears popped. It created a vacuum. And if that had been on Raw, that would have been the best Cape Fave in WWE history. But SmackDown was taped on Tuesday, shown on Thursday. By then, the dirt sheets got it. Really good, though. Excellent job by Bischoff, just as far as pulling that character off. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. And the, the, the promo the week before when Chuck proposed to Billy, that was my longest promo to that date. And then the next week, I had to get ready for the wedding. And that, I, that was five full pages that I had to memorize and turn it into myself. Because when I said certain things, had set off certain cues. <clears throat> so, um, this is where I think Vince gave me a, a reward, you know, for doing good. Just because when I jumped over to Raw with Bischoff, I got to pin Ric Flair, one, two, three, in the center of the ring. Well, not really center, towards the end, but I got to spin kick him and beat him. Yeah. Got to be the biggest one of your career. Yeah, 16-time world champion. Huge upset at the time, too. Oh, it was. Oh, you should have heard Jerry the King Lawler. <laughs> he was funny. You know what, though? Like, if you look at it, okay, you know, the, the wedding thing happens. They were they were saying, Rico, you're supposed to help us. Uh, we're really not gay. Well, and then, obviously, did I say three minutes? Three minute warning comes. Did you think you were better off with three minute warning and, and being a heel, or did you think it was working with Billy and Chuck that? that you should have stayed with them and they should have stayed healed. To me, honestly, I it didn't care what I thought. It's wherever Vince wanted to put me. That's how flexible I was. I never voiced any 
oh, oh I, I'd like to do this. I, I, I like, no, I kept my mouth shut and whatever he said, I did, you know, and three minute warning was losing heat. So the, so I got the heat back for Billy and Chuck. So then he put me with three minute warning to get heat. Right. So I stayed with them for a while. And then, uh, Eki, God rest his soul, um, got in a little trouble in Florida. So Vince either suspended him for a while. So he couldn't have two minute warning. So that's when jo Rosie went to be a uh, shit superhero yep. in training. And then <laughs> triple H approached me about being this Adrian street character. And I said, why me? He said, Vince thinks you're the only one that can pull it off. I said, is Adrian still alive? Yeah. I said, well, I got to meet with him. One, I got to ask permission to plagiarize his character, find out what he did to get it over. Cause his act, Linda is actually his wife, the girl he had. Yep. So they flew me out to Gulf breeze. I spent hours with Adrian and then I told Adrian, I said, well, I can't do what you did in the seventies by mistreat the woman, kick her down, step on her. I said, they'll shoot me in the arena. I said, so I'm going to bring the character into the millennium. I'm going to bring it into the two thousands, you know? So, and I told him this. So we went back and to thank Adrian for letting me uh, plagiarize his character. He had a wrestling costume shop called Skull Crushers. So I bought all my gear for a whole year from Adrian. So he made all my stuff all year. Wow, that was awesome. my thank you. That was my thank you to him. And right. then uh, I guess recently with the last year or so, Adrian came out and said he wasn't happy what I did with the character. He wasn't happy with the gold dust character. So he expressed his feelings. But I told him, you know, I got to bring it into the time now, you know. And I asked Stephanie for Jackie Gata. Well, she was on her way down to, she was already at OVW. They were going to release her because of that terrible match they had with Linda Miles. Yep. And they were going to give me Melina from ECW, which that no offense against Melina. She can wrestle. She's great, you know, but wasn't what the character needed. The character needed a blonde bombshell that doted over me, which yeah. would give, is he gay? Is he not gay? But he's doing all his funny stuff in the beginning. But then all of a sudden, when it's time to kick ass, all of a sudden the karate comes out. I get serious. One, two, three. You see? So that's how that, that went. And I begged Stephanie and she said, fine, she'll never wrestle. I said, I don't want her to wrestle. I want her to hand me my lipstick. I want her to do my nails. I want her to dote on me, you know. That's her job as my valet. And Stephanie said, okay. And that character worked out too. Very cool um, gimmick. And obviously, you're, you know, it's copy off of Adrian Street, but it's very cool gimmick for sure. Did you know Adrian passed away about six months ago? Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, back in July. Oh, I'm sorry. 82 years old, yeah. Oh, good. At least he was up there. Yeah. Definitely a full life uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying, I wasn't sure if you, you knew he had passed, but yeah, he passed. No. I guess it's a little bit longer than six months ago, but yeah, about seven months ago. Uh, condolences to his family and his wife. And yeah, like I said, if he told me how to do it, and I, I took it from what he told me and brought it to the millennium. And like I said, he has every right not to be happy with what I did. Right. But, you know. You can't play it exact, though. I mean, you just can't. No, <laughs> you can't do that, you know, because yeah. then then they'll, the fans, they're very smart. They'll just know what I'm doing. You know, yeah, okay, just ripping the sky off. Yeah, exactly. So when that character is, in, you know, you're getting over you, you and Haas at one point or the tag team champions. Are you expecting to get released when you do? Or is that just a total shock when you get released from WWE? Well, I got released because I asked for a raise after my three-year contract was up. Oh, okay. So that's why. Okay. I asked for a thousand bucks a week. Fifty-two thousand. That's all I asked. After holding the belts twice, 
getting two characters over. I asked for a thousand bucks a week. That's that's not even chump change for Vince. Didn't like it, and I got released. The next day, I was in Japan with Bull Buchanan winning the all Asian tag titles. I waited my 90 days, yep. the no, no compete clause, but all, the all Japan was on my butt. Come on now, come on now. I said, I can't. I'm under contract. Well, we don't recognize that contract here. I said, I recognize it here. I said, it is a contract. I did sign it. It's my word. I'm waiting for it to be up. So get me a flight out the next day and I'll show up. And that's what I did. Just that easy. That's it. Obey and, you like, and you like Japan, all Japan? You like the style? Oh, I had to learn that style. They're stiff. And I guess because I was new, and I've taken three different disciplines of martial arts, you know, plus being a police officer and a bodyguard, I know how to defend myself. A couple, a couple of days through the wrestling, when I stiffed back, all of a sudden, I wasn't getting stiffed anymore. Right, of course. Yep. Because I could shoot. Absolutely. They know. Yeah, they know. Yeah, they know. Yep. Yeah. You know, you start placing kicks in the right spot and hard. Not hard enough to, to hurt them, hard enough to wake them up. Yep. That, okay, here's your receipt. Here's your receipt. Here's your receipt. Cashed them all in within four or five days. Love I love Japan, and I probably would have stayed. Uh, the wrestling with the fans were great. Uh, they called me Mo Miyagi. That's what they called me there, Mo Miyagi. What does that mean? <laughs> That's what I asked Stephen Richards during a match. Uh, we rest, When I was with WWE, we wrestled Tokyo two days. And I went out with Stephen Richards. He was the face and I was the bad guy. So they're yelling Mo Miyagi. And the Japanese crowd is different than the America crowd. They, they're they quiet and you can really hear them. You know. And so I lock up and I ask Stevie, what are they saying? What's Mo Miyagi? He is a calling you a faggot. I break <laughs> the thing and I went, okay. And then I start shushing everybody and shut up and rah, rah, rah. We get through the match. Stevie gives me the Stevie driver or the Stevie T, whatever you called it. Right. The DDT thingy. And he gets a little bit of blah going up. And then I'm laying in the ring selling his move. And they kind of start giving me the, to get up. And then when I got up, they all started applauding. And I'm like, I don't think the Japanese have got this right. All right, so I walk up the ramp and I go find the first gaff guy, the guy that works in Japan that sets up the stage. And I asked the guy, I said, excuse me, uh, what does Momiyagi mean? He looked right at me and go, uh, Momiyagi mean uh, side burns. I said, what? Yeah, <laughs> Momiyagi means side burns. So I go find Stevie Richards, he's eating. I smack him upside the head. He looks at me, goes, what? I said, Momiyagi means sideburns, not faggot. He goes, well, what'd you ask me for? I'm not Japanese. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't think the Japanese are that disrespectful, are they? Jeez. No. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. When I was there for the three weeks, I was in the paper, ROD also. We were in a paper every day. I mean, my gosh. Sumo's the number one celebrity, and pro wrestling is number two. I love that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't go anywhere. Everybody would, Momiyagi, Momiyagi. So that stuck. Love that. Now, as we hit the wind down, head towards the finish here, why retire from the business? Were you injured? What was going on there? No, well, I was I, I was 44. And now that I wasn't part of a local WWE, you know, I had a family at the time. I was married and had kids. And I said, well, do I, do I really want to leave my family three weeks a month and go to Japan? 
and they chipped me four grand the first time. So do I want to do this? So I thought real hard and I said, you know what? No, I'm not doing it. And I'll back the belts, retired right there and went right into police academy. Hit the ground running. Six months later, graduated number one in police academy. And then that September, I was hired by the state of Nevada as an investigator. Six months later, I was a part-time United States Marshal, which is called a DSO, District Security Officer. I used to work right under the, with the Marshals, you know, court, uh, uh, prisoner transport, uh, people who were on parole, supervised supervision, people who got that revoked. Uh, we worked a lot with ICE, you know, immigrants, illegal immigrants. Yep. Did a lot of uh, appearances during sentencing when the perpetrator was being sentenced, stuff like that. So I was working five, six days a week. And I wasn't under Vince's thumb. Right. I didn't like that. That was, It was stressful for me because I didn't know whether I had a job, going to have a job, you know. And I didn't like that feeling. Got asked back. I got asked to come back twice. Told them no the first time and F no the second time. Wow, so they did want you back after all that. That's Vince's game. He, he pays you, then he fires you, then he brings you back for less money. See, I I was late later on, you know, so I had traits. You know, I was a cop, a bodyguard, a, a, a landscaper, busboy, waiter. I could do anything. But I went back to what I know, police work. And then I got, in 2015, I started to get blood clots. And in 2016, it took me out for three years. I was really sick for three years. I thought I was going to die. And then I got better from that. And now, and I had to retire medically from law enforcement. So I get my medical pension. And now I work for a giant uh, insurance company. It's called Bell United. We insure most of the hotel house limos, three or four uh, limo companies, two taxi cab companies, two tow truck companies. So I do the same thing a cop does, except I don't write tickets and I don't make arrests and I don't carry a gun. I do accident investigations, vehicle uh, loss and recovery, you know, that kind of stuff monitor the drivers in all of Clark County. So I do have a good job. I love it. I don't make as much as I do as a cop, but it's something I love to do. So no more wrestling though, as far as not, not physically wrestling in the ring. I mean like convention scenes, stuff like that. No more. Wrestling. Oh, I've, I've, I've got Renee wants me. RVD wants me to go. Nick Dinsmore wants me to start doing conventions. And once I get back in shape, you know, and get this hip fixed, I'm going to go do a few because like I said, I got a, an appreciation page that a gentleman by Terry Zhang in South Korea runs. He runs the page and I get to see fans questions. So I answer them when fans, they got my address when they send me trading cards, a picture or a card to sign, as long as they send a self, uh, self-addressed envelope, I, I sign it for free and send it back. Love it. So the still Rico name is still out there. and, and still I buzzing. can't believe it after nine, yep. 19 years. Can't believe it. I've had people ask, you know, you only, you know, would you want, did you want more time as a wrestler instead of seven years? I said, no, the man upstairs said seven years. That's it. I'm not going to force a square peg into a round hole. You know, hey, what about like a reunion tour with Billy and Chuck? I'm sure people are clamoring for that. I, if it works out, it works out. I like I said, I'd like to do a Royal Rumble run in. Wow, because nice. they I did like they did a Royal Rumble. They played my music and Santana, Santina, so whatever that guy came out, and it disappointed. They thought it was me. So Santino Morella, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I got a lot of, lot of, uh, 
texts and notifications on Facebook. We thought you were coming out, you know. Yep. But you can't re replicate the character. I'm sorry, Vince. You're not going to do it. I don't care how many people you put in it. I, I totally agree. You know that from uh, the Adrian Street stuff. You know that very well. Can't yeah. do it. Now, as far as the Facebook and all of those stuff, is there a place social media wise where fans can it can reach you? Or you yeah, know, the, the Rico Costantino appreciation page. It's okay. on Facebook. You know, I, I read all that. I answer all that, and I got to thank all the people that send their send it sent send it who sent their thoughts and prayers prior uh, surgery, after surgery. I still get them, and I answer all of them myself. So there's nobody answering that but me, you know, especially now. You know, when I'm working a lot, I don't get to answer in a timely manner, but I do answer. Any other social media that you have out there, like Twitter or uh, Instagram? Nope, just Facebook. No, I'm you're, I, you're old I, school. I, I am old school and old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For Rico, thank you so much uh, for all the time. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your patience because I know we've been trying to do this for a long time. Yep. And I appreciate your patience. Hey, you got it. Thank you, Rico. Appreciate it. You're welcome.